Here we are day one, Colsteam. We're about four hours north of Perth. We've started the Triple Crown and we're calling it the Triple Crown because we're doing three of the iconic roads that you can do with an off-road caravan in Australia. We're starting with the Gibb River, then we're doing the Tanami into the Plenty and we're packing it in. The itinerary's super tight. We're not giving these vans any rest. We're just going to punish them and see what happens. And that's really what we're out here for. R&D testing, testing these vans, making sure they're doing what they should be doing. And this one, you know, we've got the band back together. We're looking forward to it. It's going to be a challenge. About 14 days on the road, packing it all in there. Triple Crown coming at you. Look, this, this trip was sort of put together because we obviously had to get the vans back, so there was a practical element, but also we missed the plenty on the last one. We're not one to be defeated, so we were like, well, how are we going to do the gib and the plenty? Then we have to do the Tanami. But then we have to get to Broome. You know, Reg is like, well, I can show you a couple of good little tricks on the way up rather than going the highway. We decided to leave on a Friday afternoon, which was not sort of planned. We planned to leave Saturday morning. And we were able to get to a place called Coal Seam the first night. Beautiful camping spot. That was the first of our campfires. First bushy, yeah. Camp cooking. Yep. Got the oven on the coals. It was good just to get out and have a laugh with the boys and it sort of set the tone for the rest of the trip. So, Matty, uh, what's the plan for today? I don't really have any plans, mate. We'll just see, uh, see the scenery. Just a bit of a delivery trip to Broome before we get on the, on the Gib and start the Triple Crown. That's when the action really starts. That's, uh, that's where Reggie's going to have to make a decision, you know, be a man or a mouse. Come on the Gib, we'll go home. Yeah, like I said last night, if you can cut three days off it, I'll come. Come on, Reggie, please. So, Reggie, once we're out of Murchison, we're pretty much on dirt until we get onto the uh, Broome Road. Yeah, until you get on the road heading to Port Hedland, and then we head into Marble Bar and you're on a bit more dirt. Yeah, nice. And then, obviously, the whole Gibbs dirt. The link road from the Gibb down to the Tanami, is that dirt? No, from Horse Creek, it's dirt all the way. That's what we came for, boys. You yeah, beauty. Has anyone put in their uh, pre-order for the burgers for lunch? Probably the, uh, the highlight of Reggie's input from the last trip was hamburger, so gotta, gotta have that again. Thanks a lot. That homemade chutney good. And that was our first night stop, so we're a little bit ahead of ourselves. Then we pushed on to Mount Augustus, which was a uh, a fairly long day coming from coal seam. Uh, had a major incident, a major failure. The uh, bike rack, or well, the bikes actually came off the bike rack. Just driving and looked in the rear view and there was no bikes there. Anyway, we're all good, back on the road. So really today's just a moving day, you know, heading north. It's pretty easy driving, a few corrugations, but nothing major, pretty much used to it now. So um, just testing everything out, did a bit of service work, changed some air filters, stuff like that. Just making sure everything's bedding in again before we get onto the gib and the serious sort of stuff starts between there and the Tanami. So moving day, you know, getting reacquainted with everyone, having some giggles along the way, but uh, looking forward for another fire cooked meal from Dave and Raf tonight. And then uh, off again early tomorrow and probably another sort of eight or 10 hours in the saddle tomorrow getting further north. When we came in to Mount Augustus there at the station there, it was, it was pitch black, so we didn't really know what we, what we came here for. And it was pretty dusty and, and we were all pretty tired. We, we put in a stack of Ks and then in the morning when we woke up, I think everyone was just gobsmacked. Then we got the drone out, we got the cameras out, everyone just first thing in the morning was just in awe of this massive rock. It was brilliant. And Ridge has been talking this one up, but we know what Ridge's talk up cups like, so we weren't quite sure. But I have to say, this morning we woke up with a beautiful Mount Augustus in the in the background here, and this setting is absolutely stunning. Just having a coffee, so we uh, have the attitude adjustment, so we're right to go for the morning, and then we're going to continue to head north after we swing over and have a look at this rock, and it's the world's largest rock. It's actually three times bigger than Uluru, and most of it's underground, but it's still really spectacular with the sun coming up on it, so beautiful way to start the day. Then we're going to hit the road and hit, keep heading north and get some more k's done so not exactly sure where we'll land tonight we're just going to keep pushing up and uh, and see where we get to first lady on the way home straight through the top of the sidewall we'll try and uh, plug it see how we go the start of dave's royal wa tire Whoa, popping tour is what he liked to call it yeah that guy's rough on the gear 
He did two in like five minutes. Do that. another one on Dave's car this time. Just make a big I don't even know if it's a kilometre. Well, that's what I'm Maybe one, maybe, maybe two. Get him, get him to get his gun. We've done about eight kilometres this morning. Two hours. Yeah, the rocks out there, uh, just they just get so sharp, uh, much sharper than anywhere in the country. So, um, yeah, had a couple of, of punctures purely because of incorrect pressures. So, um, yeah, we plugged those, they weren't too bad, and uh, we, we kept on going. Talking of stories, David, what do you tell us about your two bloody flat tyres? Yeah, a little bit of a disagreement around tyre pressures this morning out of a few of the different camps, and we obviously went with the uh, wrong recommendation. You didn't read the booklet, did you? Oh, you've got that book on tyre pressures, do you? Yeah, yeah, it's uh, off-road car driving 101. Yeah, right, Oath, if you don't mind, so I'll um, just borrow that off you and put it through the photocopier. Um, general rule on a road like this, where you're going to do about 80k an hour, um, you're going to be anywhere from about 27 to 32, it depends on how much weight and the style of tyre. It's, uh, it's just an iconic drive from Mount Augustus to Tom Price, going past Ashburton Downs. We were actually told you couldn't do that road. They, they may have done some work to it, but yeah, there was um, some reasonable washouts, but really interesting drive, eh? nice twisty, lots of dust gravel. The scenery out there was just beautiful. Absolutely beautiful road, didn't, didn't see another car on the whole, whole trip for, I don't know what that was, I guess, a yeah, good few hundred kilometres. Uh, we're just trying to try and find a nice camp somewhere within range of Tom Price and uh, Raf's going to uh, get the, the Oz pig over the fire and we'll uh, cook up a nice spaghetti. We stayed that night at Hammersley Gorge, which again, another beautiful spot. That was really the start of the Gorge tour of WA. That was number two, but that was definitely the best. All of a sudden you walk down some stairs and you, you're at some amazing gorge like Hammersley Gorge where you're just stunned by the, the beauty and the, just the clearness of the water. We're waking up this morning and we've come down to the gorge here to have a look and the boys are having a bit of a clean and a freshen up in the water. This place is spectacular, I have to say. If you get out here, you have to do it. It is just beautiful in the middle of nowhere. It's beautiful waterfall and rock formation. It's absolutely spectacular. And, I've never seen anything like this. It's uh, it's pretty special to be here, and boys have had a bit of a bit of a freshen up, and uh, we'll hit the road. Welcome to the Pilbara, boys. This is pretty sick, though. You know, it's just all flat off to the off to the right there, and then a little mountain range. It's one of those ranges called Reginald. Yeah, the Hammersley Range is there, uh, one of the richest iron ore deposits in the world, and largest. The Pilbara, I think, probably was. Uh... Almost one of my favourite spots. Yeah, again, just another unique part of the country where we haven't seen sort of countryside and land like that. The road itself was a pretty unchallenging road. It was just a really well graded dirt road with lots of mining traffic, but you got up next to the train that was running along there, running the, um, the mining material. That's train. a long train, yeah. Went for days. Went for days. Whitnoon Gorge, um, beautiful place. Where you can spend a few days, you know, in there walking around and checking things out. Not down the mine end. Don't recommend anyone goes down the mine end. Everybody happy to roll into the asbestos mine? Yeah, we're not actually going into the mine. It's uh, all bundled off. You can't get in there now unless you climb over a mountain of stuff. Jumpy that, Reggie. We're all happy. So, can you just tell me where the mine is in relation to where we are right now, Reginald? Yeah, the mine's right up the back end of the uh, for me that was one of the ones that Ridge had told us about and I couldn't quite believe how that was going to roll out. Mm. I was like, asbestos mine, sounds risky, not sure it'll happen. Yeah. And the, even the drive in there was really interesting, wasn't it? Because you could just see yeah, sort of the old town that's just not there anymore. Yeah. So pretty amazing yeah. bit of history, you know. And obviously we, we were very cautious, we wanted to be on the safe side, but yeah, absolutely worth it. Look, that was a highlight for me once we got in there. Just completely desolate, but beautiful high gorge faces and stuff. A little underbody scrub for the afternoon. That's good. Wash the mud off the side rails. We just pulled up beside a nice little billabong. Just big escalating rock shaly hills that are red, obviously. Famous to the Pilbara. Magnificent country. Got a bit of press on driving to do today, but um, 
definitely keen to take 10 minutes out and sit here for a while and uh, soak it all in. There was a gorge basically 30k out from uh, Marble Bar. Um, there's a huge amount of erosion gully, so it was, it was fantastic. It was straight away. It was even before the trip really for us started for R&D. The boys were testing the van straight away, so you could see you know the venture suspension working. You could see the difference between Reggie's off-road, or just you know cruising through it. That was probably that was probably the first of us overextending the venture series. You know, we took it into this little track, and she was. You know, rock crawling and steep ascents and descents and little mounds and stuff and you know for me it was pretty good to see how tough it was you know because it was drawbar on the ground and then the rear of the van on the ground it's not something that we'd recommend you doing but at the same time you know we can do it and we can make sure that everything's holding in there and I'm glad you drove that and not me <laughs> we had the 20 foot 6 venture and the 21 foot off road and the off road had just breezed in you know it wasn't even it was nothing to that thing, so that was basically the, the, the starting of opening your eyes as to what, you know, Adventure Series really was going to be comfortable doing as opposed to an off-roading. So it was a pretty awesome camp spot. We, we beat some South African tourists to it, so that was pretty cool. There is no way without someone that had been there before, a bit of local knowledge, you'd know about that place, eh? No. Yeah, and that was why part of having Reg along is such a great, you know, wealth of knowledge, especially on that side of the country. Oh, yeah, he's Mr WA. Today's really been one of those special ones. It's had a bit of everything and where we're set up now is really what we're doing this for, you know. This is the complete, it's the epitome of free camping. We're actually on a little riverbed at Glen Herring Gorge. This is really about as touristy as we like to get. This is just spectacular. So set up in the uh, in the gorge here for the night. And that was our big, big send off night for Reggie. So we had a, we had a good night around the fire. Um, yeah, Raf and Ricky did an awesome job cooking. So um, it was fantastic. That day was highs and lows for me. Little lowsies in the morning. It was definitely tough to say goodbye to Reg. He, he was an integral part of the first trip and obviously planning the first stage of this trip as well. And probably more than anything, I you know, wanted his van. It would have been the ideal van. Yeah. But you just come around the corner and there's this old gold mine with this massive chimney and the scenery there was amazing. Yeah, we just yeah. stopped on the side of the road and there's this beautiful old gold mine. And you come around the corner and you go into Marble Bar. So this morning's pit stop's in a place called Marble Bar and it's a small little town but this is the feature, it's this rock formation and originally it was thought to be marble, hence the name of the town, but it later proved to be Jasper. I don't know the difference, it still looks quite pretty, nice place to stop but I guess it's significant for us because we're about to say goodbye to Reg, we're going in different ways. Sad day, anyway, onwards and upwards, off to Broome we go. Yeah, everything's gone to plan, we're, we're a day ahead which is, is even better still. Um... You never know though, you know, things when you come out here, they, they happen very quickly. Uh, I just wish the boys are uh, near some civilization when they, if they do have any, any trouble, because that's the, that's the problem out here. You're so far away when anything does break and things do break. So be careful, keep calm. <laughs> Yeah, we had to wave old Reggie off. I don't, I don't think he really wanted to leave and uh, we didn't want him to go either. He uh, definitely keeps a, a good balance in the camp when he's around and keeps us uh, a little bit cooler and a little less hot under the pedal. There you go, Reggie. No one leaves empty handed, yeah. mate. That's all I've got we'll to get back to we'll Perth. There you go. <laughs> we said goodbye to Reggie. We hightailed it with a massive headwind out to Broome. Cable Beach named after the telegraph cable laid between Broome and Java in 1889 with waves that are mostly gentle in the dry season from May to October. Well look at that, some gentle waves out there. You're driving down onto the, this, this beautiful beach and you know we couldn't have timed it any better. I think we entered down onto the beach at about 4.30 in the afternoon. There was multiple people getting onto the beach and going and having their sunset drink. Um, wherever they pleased on a low tide beach and yeah we had a great time did a nice photo shoot there and just yeah actually got to sit down and chill out and you know take it for what it actually is so that sort of put us back on on track you know reset the mind frame that not, not all was lost without reggie and we managed to get some absolutely epic sunset shots so i think the boys were pretty wrapped uh, that we stopped there you know it's considered probably one of the best sunsets in the world it's definitely uh, in my eyes the best sunset in australia had a nice little meal at sunsets there, right on the beach and caught it a night, you know. We had a bit of work to do in the morning. Had to do a couple of um, yeah, inner tube repairs on the tyres. So yeah, we're under the pump trying to get to Winjana Gorge. 
So we're just filling up in Derby, getting our last lot of supplies before heading out onto the gig. Uh, my old girl chews a fair bit more fuel than the other guys, 200, so I got seven 20 litre jerry cans to fill up and put in the front toolbox. Definitely not a whole lot after here, so we've got a heap of food, plenty of fuel and uh, should keep us going. We're going to try and get to Winjana Gorge tonight, but uh, sun's definitely getting low, so do our usual trick and probably get into camp once the sun's gone down. Oh, this is that boy's start of the Triple Crown, Gib River Road. Here she is. Yo, Gib. There's a lot of closed signs up there. There's a lot of closed signs up there. Closed, 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 closed. Open. Gib we'll take the open. This is gold, uh, is what we came for, the old Gib River. First of the Triple Crown. Anyone at work always asks me, you know, can your vans do the Gib River Road? Here we go, let's find out. Yeah, it was pretty good to be honest. It was it was nice. It probably saved our bacon because if it was bad road condition, we would have been driving until the next day. But... The Gibb River Road was originally constructed as a beef road to transport cattle from the outlying central Kimberley cattle stations to the ports at Wyndham and Derby. Today, the Gibb River Road cuts through the heart of the Kimberley. This landscape entices people to explore water, awesome waterfalls, waterholes, and spectacular gorges. Uh, so we're at the start of the uh, the dirt section of the Gibb River Road, so going from uh, west to east, and uh, just airing down from bitumen pressures, so going down from about 34, 35 psi, down to about 28 to 30, uh, just keep it nice and safe. Uh, gives us a really nice ride along the corrugations, allows us to go a little bit quicker, um, and also protects our tyres as well, and, and, and the car, so that you don't shake your teeth out from the back of you. So. Um, yeah, so we'll get down to about 28 PSI, I think, and then uh, keep going on to Winjana Gorge. You know, there were so many unexpected times that we had to travel uh, in the darkness. My piece of advice is get, get some good lights on that bull bar, and I definitely wouldn't tour anywhere around Australia without an ARB bull bar. And I know it saved, you know, two of our trucks multiple times. Uh, I think it was quite late by the time we got there. So, um, yeah, it was absolutely packed. We were all shocked at how busy it was. So that was a little bit disappointing. But I think when everyone woke up, they were absolutely amazed when they saw the gorge right behind them. So it's a pretty, pretty awesome spot and very rare to be able to camp near such a large gorge. We currently are at Winjana Gorge and it's early, so we beat the, the masses down here. The sun's just coming up. You can see it on the gorge over here. It's absolutely spectacular. It's not a lot of water, but the setting's just amazing. Nick's told us he's crocodiles, so looking for crocodiles. Winjana never, never, never fails with crocs. There's always a stack of freshies, so I think we saw about four freshies there, which was which was pretty cool for the guys. I mean, the Kimberleys is spectacular. There's a reason that people talk about it, and it's a destination for an off-road caravan owner. Yeah. Gibb River Road is definitely right up there, you know. It's kind of hoping for something a little bit gnarly. To be honest, it's a bit plain sailing. I was a little disappointed. I was really hoping for it to be as corrugated as it was when I was here last, just so you guys can actually see it at its worst. So I'm um, just to experience it. I was hoping for that too. Yeah, same here. That's what we came for. Don't want to just get through and be like, oh, I think it was pretty easy. I can see why or how it deteriorated. I mean, it's not perfect condition road, but certainly expecting something a little bit more challenging. I mean, probably speaking too soon anyway, right? Uh, yeah, it's been luck of the draw, I suppose, um, on the gib. One minute, you know, it's smooth and you, you finish it and you tell the next bloke that's heading the other way. Um, you know, it's all great, you can go along at 80k an hour and then the poor bloke's cursing you because it's had a stack of traffic through it and there's a truckload of uh, corrugations. We're at Barnett Roadhouse. Uh, I've been on the road for about an hour and a half, something like that. Reasonable condition, nothing really to write home about. See, it's probably started to deteriorate the further we got into the gib, but almost a little bit of a letdown how good the gib is at this stage, but it certainly has deteriorated a little bit, so we'll see how it goes from here. I think a little water crossings and stuff. Well, it must be amazing when it's right on the cusp of wet season. Getting more water over the road would make it pretty interesting, but it's a, it's a very scenic drive, put it that way. I'd have to say that Manning Gorge was definitely my standout. You know, from that little boat ride across, you know, even the little I guess lagoon or whatever it was where we you know went across in the boat was you know I was thinking that was pretty good. Uh, we're at the Manning Gorge, about a two and a half k walk out here through some bushfire barren land and you arrive at 
this. I'm uh, still trying to make my mind up whether it overtakes, you know, Lake Mackenzie from at home, but definitely probably one of the nicest little waterways I've ever seen. It's just magical, just tea trees and reeds and crystal clear water with rock formations and little white beaches. It's I've never really, yeah, I've never seen anything like this before. I suppose it shows that, you know, you can take the cars and the vans to these these beautiful places, and that's that's the reason why, you know, you, you take a good car and, and a good van so you can experience the gorgeous country that we have. Back when I did the Kimberley, it was probably five and a half years ago, six years ago, um, where we ended up camping right at, right along uh, the river there. Uh, it's a massive uh, sandy bank, and there was no one camping there. We, we basically created that camp spot. So it was a bit unfortunate when we dropped in. There was a, a few a few campers parked actually on the track there, but um, yeah, we managed to, to pioneer our way and camped on the river. And I know the boys absolutely loved it. Uh, that night, I think we really decided. Dave and I sort of pushed to do <laughs> to do Mitchell's um, at, uh, at Matt's dismay. Obviously, Mitchell and the uh, Columbaroo Road was one of the ones that was put out by a bunch of our customers and friends that said, you know, she's a tough one, I don't know whether you'll get your vans up there, which uh, that's always the best thing to say to me if you uh, want to see a van get taken somewhere. Yeah, that was the next day's plan was to head out to the falls and take the vans out there, even though we've been told don't take the vans out there. Yeah, I guess this Columbaroo Road's probably a little bit more as to what I was expecting for up here. Three times worse than the car, the worst car as we saw yesterday on the Gip. Usual thing though, the rougher the country, the nicer the landscape. We're just monitoring the CRS because it's obviously not really built for these high volume corrugations. Dropped the tyre pressures about uh, what, 45 minutes ago and we're just checking the, ch the shocks to see what it's done. It's made a big difference actually, so the tyre pressure is the key there. And we've got the tyre pressure monitors on there so we're keeping an eye on that. So it's all, um, it's all working but it's important to check, you know, look after the gear just a, a, a really rough road and you know once you do come off the Columbaroo track and you're heading into Mitchell Falls it's it's not really a track that I see that really gets maintained. It is just a beautiful track rolling along the ranges and countless creek crossings and you know, every creek is just crystal clear. We're trying to get to Mitchell Falls and back in a day, which is ludicrous, really. I mean, it's, it's you know, if you had to grade an off-road road as, you know, good to bad, this would be right up the top as far as the condition of the road. And we were trying to pull the venture down there and do it quickly. And, you know, we were really shocking the van quite badly. The CRS suspension is a country road suspension. It's trailing arm dual shock, nice engineering, but it's limited in the travel and therefore the stiffness um, and therefore the shock loading through the van. And you know, we uh, we stopped to, to check, um, just to check the van and we'd seen that the face of the microwave had started to let go from the microwave and um, one of the bolts that hold um, the speaker had actually broken off in the speaker. Um, so, you know, we were starting to ask questions at that stage as to whether or not we should continue. You know, um, I guess we had the, uh, you know, the voice of Reg up in the air going, you guys turn around, you fools, you, you know, you're pushing it too hard. And, uh, you know, we thought we'd give it another little nudge and probably checked it another 10 k's down the road. and. At that stage, we were just like, you know, we, this isn't sensible to continue. Uh, you see the venture's parked in the bush. Um, we're actually going to whip it around and take it back. We're about 30 k's from Mitchell, which is a bit disappointing. Really wanted to see it, but, um, you know, this van is a semi-off-road or dirt road caravan. It's got country road suspension, and, um, you know, we've been uh, putting it over some pretty heavy corrugations, and the deterioration of the track through here is just probably um, um, hit its limit, so we're going we're gonna to turn it around. You know, people always ask us, what's the limit of uh, a venture caravan? This is way beyond it, really. <laughs> it's, uh, you know, this is a pretty heavy off-road track, so, you know, the off-road is going fine. Everyone else is going to continue up there and, uh, and see the falls, but I'll uh, head back towards Drysdale and um, just mosey on, look after the van. Yeah, it was tough. I, you know, we don't start things like this to, to be beaten, and, um, you know, I feel like in this case we, we made the right decision to stop. We probably should have made it earlier, really, mm. um, but... 
you know, it, it's, it's for me, it's a pretty clear line. You know, we have the Venture Series, it's a semi off road caravan or a dirt road caravan. Um, you know, high volume, large corrugations is basically why we build our off road caravans the way we build our off road caravans to handle that stuff. All in all, the, the 16 held up really well on that track. Um, you know, I would be confident taking an off-road van in there and just, you know, doing the right thing and, and not, not pushing the limits. But, um, you know, the off-road's made for doing those sorts of tracks. Well, we've made it to Mitchell Falls. Um, she's definitely the bit of Kimberley we were looking for as far as uh, rough roads and, and harsh conditions. She's a, she's a tough long track in here. I think it took us about seven hours. Maddie turned around uh, probably the last bit, which is fair enough. It's been pretty hard. It's, you know, heavy corrugations and it's just, you know, not really what the venture's made for. But, you know, once we got there, it was a, a good thing to tick off and jumped in the Jet Ranger and went and checked out the Mitchell Falls, which, you know, again, obviously well worth checking out. We managed to uh, do a brilliant helicopter flight and, and just see the beauty of, of the Kimberley from the air. It's, yeah, you've got to do it. So it's, it's one thing that I recommend to everyone. You get there and the reward is get up in, the, in a helicopter. You can hike it, you can drive it, but yeah, when you get there, just to see the vastness of it, uh, how the local indigenous people used to live and where, how remote it was, it was absolutely amazing. We got back pretty late. It was all fine, we thought it was great. We were toasting, we had a few beers, good feed uh, there, drives they'll always have a good buffet and a good burger, so we had a good feed. And then we woke up in the morning. <laughs> uh, doing a little bit of bush mechanic scenario. Just done a little bit of a walk around the van this morning and seen that one of the suspension mounts um, that we actually found on the gun barrel that was um, a little bit weaker than we'd expected. Um, it got repaired in Perth on the side that we damaged on the gun barrel, but now the other side's done it. We thought the whole thing had been repaired, but they've actually missed one side. So instead of going on with it compromised, um, we're just going to do a bit of bit of bush mechanic work here, and Dave's going to get the welder out. So it's not an ongoing issue. It's just something that we've had, and this is the demo. Um, that we, we thought we had it rectified um, in Perth, but um, we probably didn't check it closely enough to make sure that it was all squared away. And then we're you know driving out the driveway and. Um for whatever reason, I was actually looking at Dave's trailer brakes, he was having an issue with his red arc and um, went back to look at the plug and then it obviously been a horrendous amount of load there, they completely um, yeah, destroyed that whole back end of, of the truck. The whole rear end of the chassis of the 79 with the, the drawbar attached to it, we've actually got pieces of metal that have been sheared, uh, like six mil plate. So um, yeah, it's probably really got us thinking how much of a beating these vans took on the way to Mitchell Falls yesterday and clearly we've been pushing it a bit too hard so I think we all just need to back off a bit and um, otherwise we won't get this gear out of the Kimberley. Luckily we've got the support vehicle Nick from ARBs here so we're going to change, uh, change the 166 over to his truck. The van ended up on the Ranger. Uh, it actually sat nicer on the back of the Ranger than it did the 70. We used the, um, the links to pump up the airbags. So um, yeah, we only had the airbags up to 30 PSI, leveled the van out, and it really towed like a dream. We could hook along really, really nicely. Hey, you like it having a van on the back, Tricky? Yeah, mate, this thing's towing like a dream, really. Um, look, most of, most of the touring and towing that I've ever done has always been in a big Land Cruiser, but having it on the back of the, of the Ranger, which is pretty lightweight, um, I thought, to be honest, I was a bit worried, but mate, it's just, Honestly, hats off to you. I said, I said it to you before, mate. Yeah, you've, you've built a van that honestly tows like an absolute dream. You know, finishing off the day on the gib and just again, creek crossings that are perfectly clear. Coming down into the uh, Pentecost River is one of those ones where you come across the top of the range and it's it's all just presented to you. And there's a few lookouts as you wind down the road. Yeah, and that's you know one of the iconic sort of images of the Kimberley. I think is that. Pentecost River with the ranges in the background and you know you just when you when you think of the Kimberley that's kind of what you picture and, and for me that really capped off our trip up there you know. It bookends the Kimberley doesn't it it's like here's the Pentecost doosh yeah. end of the Kimberley thanks for coming. It's one of those things I think you got to see with your own two eyes to understand the beauty of it yeah, it's just a magical look. Yeah the old Gibber River Road eh? It wasn't, uh, wasn't quite what the hot was about but definitely got a bit of work to do to uh, get these things tidied up for the next two. It was probably um, the road, the tracks off, the give that's been the harshest this time for us anyway was the Columbia Road and 
out into our Mitchell National Park. Man, that one to the National Park's the hardest thing you've ever done on this venture, that's for sure. There's even times with gun barrel. But, um, you know, the, the venture's pretty much good to go. Maybe a couple of little bolts here and there, and then just got to fix Dave's truck, eh? What's the plan there, David? Yeah, I thought that would have been about busting my truck, but um, lucky serves me right. Going way too quick through those roads yesterday. It just been up and up. Oh well, fingers crossed there's someone in our quest with a little bit of uh, a little bit of steel and they're pulling us to help on a Saturday afternoon. We're hightailing it, trying to get, get to El Questro before their workshop closes. And um, yeah, we sort of, we, we missed the shop. Uh, luckily I got, I got to speak to the foreman there, Kev. He was, he was a legend, he said uh, he'll give it a crack. I guess once we started pulling the, the rear bar off the, the chassis, we sort of started finding some more issues that definitely weren't going to be able to be fixed in the day. And you know, at that point we probably just thought, you know, Nick, Nick had a perfectly capable truck at this point in time and he definitely uh, wasn't concerned about towing the 16 back, he was almost excited, so I passed the baton to him and, um, yeah, let him go from there. Yeah, it's been a uh, slow couple of days, uh, last two mornings have been held up with us mucking around with repairs and that's definitely tightened up the schedule, we didn't get away until 12 today and we're trying to get into the bungles this afternoon and probably stay there tonight but um, yeah either way we're, we're, we're a tad behind schedule so put the foot down and uh, get to where we need to get to. No, we just got to unhook the um, venture because you can't have dual axles into the bungle bungle so um, we're going to leave the 20 foot 6 here and then we're going to go in and uh, get some shots and have a look around. You know that whole drive in it's like 60 k's of uh, just tight windy track and it's just super tight and, uh, and it probably would have taken us hours to get down there. We got to the edge of the bungles um, and I think you know we probably we drove it was only about a k around uh, at the front of it but it was beautiful to see just those those reds were just brilliant with the sunset so we're quite fortunate to get there. We're here we're in uh, just out the front of the bungles as you can see behind us and we've got a bit of a compacted schedule now because of the issues with this thing this morning and a bit going on with the venture yesterday so and we're in danger of dropping a whole day behind which is uh, not what we can really uh, afford at this stage so this is as far as close as we're going to get. Absolutely beautiful sight, as you can see the drive in here is amazing, nice and winding, but we're going to have to hook around, get out of here and we're heading towards Wolf Creek. Now that was a little bit airy because we drove in there in the middle of the night and you drive into this strange little camp set up and there's all these cars placed around and you know no one's really that clear on the story for Wolf Creek so we were sort of, I don't know, a little, I was a little bit on edge anyway, I just basically got out of the car and got in the caravan and went to bed and locked the door. Locked ourselves in. <laughs> So here we are this morning, early morning at uh, Wolf Creek and last night was a mad dash to get here. We pulled up at camp pretty late last night, a little bit of an eerie drive and was sort of campers scattered around the little campground and then the, the rock crater this morning is what we wake up with and we're going to go have a little wander up there and have a look around. It's only a short, I think it's a 200, 300 metre hike, but it's actually quite steep. And when you're up there, the wind's absolutely blowing a gale. It was just brilliant to see. You just stand there and just, and reading the history about it and how it actually, how it occurred and the theory behind it. It's insane. So yeah, we jumped straight onto the Tanami. So the plan was to do the whole Tanami in a day, uh, towing full-size vans. So with a massive headwind, I think we had a 20 knot to 30 knot wind. It was absolutely insane. We stopped at uh, Billaluna, which is which sort of bookmarks uh, the end of the canning. I just stopped in this little town to get fuel. It's the last place I think we can get it for 600 k. So fill up all the jerry, jerry can and should be able to get down the Tanami. You know, there's a number of things that were against us. Mm. You know, the Tanami in a day, you know, massively ambitious, especially with a semi-off-road caravan. Again, the suspension's not made to do high volume corrugations for hours at a time, which is exactly what we're asking it to do. Where's your fuel at, Matthew? Uh, we just dropped under half, and we've probably used the first half a tank in 200 kilometres. Yeah, right, so we need about 270, 260 in jerry cans for you. Where's your tank at, Nick? Uh, probably two-thirds. Yeah, copy. I reckon, uh, yeah, it's going to be real tight. We knew it was going to be tight. Mm. We didn't quite realise that the wind was going to be as bad as it was. So, you know, headwind towing full-size van, it really affects the fuel economy. We all need to take responsibility. We probably miscalculated the amount of fuel we're going to use. Um, I think it was pretty ordinary fuel. I think it was the worst fuel economy all of us got for the whole trip. So I think we had pretty ordinary fuel as well. 
But it just shows that, you know, they're the things that you gotta plan around. So I suppose the suspense for us was, who's gonna make it? You know, every couple of minutes was someone going, what's your fuel economy? Where's your gauge? So it looks like we're gonna make it. It's just we're not gonna make it in the time frame that they're open, is that right? Mate, I think it's pretty marginal on us making it. I think it's super marginal on both making it. We're definitely not making it in the time when it's open. It made for an interesting evening. I think we, we stopped three or four times. I think it was four times in, in, in total. Where's your gauge at, Tricky? Uh, mate, it's been sitting on uh, empty for about, I reckon, 80 k's. So, mate, I reckon I've probably got another 50 k's to go. So, I don't know how, how much further we've got to go, Nino. I think it's about 70 odd k's. Yeah, mate, I think it's about 70. Um, all right, well, we're still looking pretty good. So, just, you know, just let us know. Yeah, mate, pushed it um, as far as we could go. Never run, uh, as I said before, never run the Ranger as a tourer, so didn't really know its limit with uh, with fuel. So now we do. It was a pretty horrid day for headwind. So um, a little disappointed, to be honest, with the, with the fuel economy. We basically drove the whole day mm. um, and then managed to get to the fuel station with about two litres left of diesel between all of us. Yeah. Now, we were on... Uh, the empty light for about 100 k's. Mm. You know, it's something to take away from when you do trips like this is know your fuel range. Mm. You know, overcompensate with your capacity. Don't just try and make it so it works okay. Um, and then, you know, obviously looking after your gear, so tyre pressures, speed, all of that stuff is really um, important. We, we missed uh, the Tilmouth road, road stop. So we just camped out the front, uh, waiting for it to open the next morning. So this is the cabin air filter from the 200 series. And this is the new one after uh, 10 days on the road, doing the gib, doing the tanami, a lot of sand, a lot of dirt. We got a nice fresh filter. I'm gonna breathe some clean air for the next few days. After so much touring, the last trip and, and this trip, uh, a fair few remote fill-ups. You get a pretty cruddy diesel out there. So um, even with a secondary filter that Matt's got, um, the factory filter does tend to clog up, so yeah, you just always carry a spare fuel filter. Pretty easy road stop maintenance. Morning, mate. The plenty, boys. Oh, mate, the plenty is a good one. It's pretty much the whole reason we're doing this trip because we missed it on the last one. Otherwise, we were just going to do the gib and then send it home. Been pretty interesting. Come check this one out. Well, hopefully, there's not too many bumps in it. Yeah. Ventures. Uh, it's a holiday. It was a little bit dirty at the boys when we got in the plenty because they're like, oh, this is so easy, it's so crazy. I don't know what everyone's talking about. And I'm just like, as soon as you say that, it's going to be bad. And after the gem tree, it was a horror show. It really got bad. There was just sections that were just disgusting, just big washed out corrugations and bull dust. And yeah, for me, that was by far the hardest. It's the hardest road we've done on both the trips. You know, for me, it caps the gun barrel easily yeah. as far as, you know, punishment for the car and van. You, you find out pretty quickly what a dust hole is on the plenty, and you, you really know what one is when you hit one at 100 k's an hour. Uh, you don't know how deep they are. They can just look like normal road, um, and it's just horrible on the gear. I know Matt was quite concerned about the Venture. You know, it's a dirt rotor. It's not an off-roader, so um, we're really, you know, putting something right out of its comfort zone. And um, it was just, it was brilliant. We, we made it, I think we got almost to the end. It was almost to Bullia. We had an awesome uh, camp spot there for Ricky's birthday. That was a great way to celebrate, you know, out in the middle of the desert out there and just camped by the side of the road, cooked up some steaks. I think I had a little, uh, little birthday cake mint slice. It was beautiful. Plenty to Burswell was the next day and that it was, was... quite sparse, that, that ground across there, wasn't it? You know, it was like being on another planet, Those the rocks out there, and there was just no vegetation. It was uh, really barren sort of land. Now we're hooking along uh, the Air Development Road, headed to Big Red, a little surprise entry. Nick dropped that one on us a few days ago, decided, why don't we go and put these things on top of Big Red? Do you reckon the chances are, Nick, I've never seen this thing? <laughs> yeah, it's probably a really dumb suggestion now that I think of it. But yeah, no, we've, I reckon we're up for the challenge. Everything else that we've done, we've conquered. So um, what, I thought what better way to uh, end a trip with uh, the most iconic sand dune in the country. Either way you look at it, we've uh, officially con conquered the uh, Triple Crown. That's all right. Mate, we did the Triple Crown and we added the Jewel with Mitchell Plateau. That's just, yeah, can't get any better than that. Uh, I hate to say it, but I'm pretty sure I'm afraid she was with us.
Yeah, as luck would have it. Just finished a triple can, got off the hard roads, and um, it's actually blowing a bearing on the inside, and I've you know, probably been running on it for a while, so it's um, done a bit of damage to the hub and stuff. When you're remote like this, it's pretty hard to get stuff. Um, you know, obviously, they don't stock things, so. You know, it's another good lesson as far as preparation goes for me. You know, if we had trailer bearings there, we would have been able to continue with it. Yeah. Um, I, I thought we did have a set of trailer bearings, but we didn't, and that's something that we should have known we had or we didn't have. So for me, it had ticked the boxes, you know, it had done the triple crown, and it, it had done them, you know, in some pretty adverse conditions with, um, you know, lead foot Dave smashing it over some pretty horrendous terrain and you know, a bit of a tear in the eye to leave it behind. All right, here we are, uh, Fly City, just out of Birdsville. Big Red, we're going to take it on. Fortune favours the bold. It wasn't on the list, but hey, we're going to wrap it up with something. So we're going to see if we can get all the gear up here. Should be a good giggle. We had a crack with the Venture because we didn't have the 16 foot 6. So we we're fighting time, light was an issue. And I think, yeah, it was a brilliant attempt. I think we got, we, we were three quarters of the way up with a full size, you know, semi off-road van. Yeah, well, we had a good crack at getting the old venture up the dune. We got it, you know, a fair way up there, and then uh, just at the last section, it was really soft on top. Yeah, I mean, if we had more time, we probably would have put it on the winch and dragged it up, and you know, not to not get the venture up there. Yeah, sure, it's a bit disappointing. Got the other rigs up, had a good laugh, you know, and that's sort of, I guess, for me, sort of what rounds the whole thing out, you know, having a crack and having a good time while you're doing it. We made it through to Big Red tonight, and that was the last little bit that got thrown in, but. Um it's definitely got a little hankering on for where we could be planning on coming at some point soon, but it's an awesome spot up here and it's been heaps of fun in the sand and it's been a uh, 12 day trip since we left Perth. You know, from a R and D point of view, um, I've learned a hell of a lot about the vans and I think there's a lot of discussion points. Like the trip itself was the challenge this time around. It wasn't so much going to look at the pretty stuff and, you know, do a big name road. We decided we were going to do three big name roads and we're going to do them quick. And we were going to try and see as much as we could at the same time. So it's been a jam packed two weeks. You know, we've given the vans everything. We've given the cars everything. You know, we've got casualties on all fronts, really. You know, the main thing for me out of this trip, other than, you know, it's been a good time, we've had heaps of camp cook-ups around the fire and stuff, is, is knowing that the structural integrity of a zone RV is pretty well unbeatable. Um, but also, you have to make sure that you're prepared to do these trips. And the roads that we have done, you know, the Tanami and the Plenty Highway particularly are arterial routes really for off-road people. And, you know, don't go there if you want to have a little sightseeing tour, but if you want to go and get amongst what off-road caravanning in Australia is like, full-size caravanning, those are some roads to do and, and put your gear to the test. But again, make sure you're prepared, make sure you've got some good stuff and, you know, maybe take a bit longer than we took. <laughs> maybe hang out and see a few of the sights and sounds. So. Uh, I think we have proved the point. We've been to some extremely remote places um, and unforgiving tracks and we've done it in, in a crazy time frame. A lot of people would say it's crazy, but I suppose, how are you supposed to R&D test if you don't do something out, you know, out of the ordinary? If you just do what everyone else does, it's not really R&D testing. Uh, just the extreme, the absolute punishment of Australian outback roads and road after road, corrugation after corrugation. Um, it just, to me, it just highlighted, you know, just how harsh the country is. I think both Zone and RCRB Maruchito has come away with with a, a better understanding um, of, of the tracks, the vehicles, the vans, um, and even in just in improving our advice to our customers. You know, I think we'll, we'll definitely mix up what vans we're taking next time. I mean, I think we've learnt what we need to learn on the venture. Um, I don't think we need to go putting the venture past its limits like what we are. And, but going and seeing, you know, again, how an off-road's going to perform out there and it's as a big full size, I'll be, I'll be keen to go back and do that. You know, to come out with the wealth of knowledge that we've got, yeah, for sure it's valuable and, you know, for that reason, uh, you know, it's been a really good productive use of time. You know, it's probably left a few little doors ajar, you know, seeing that canning stock route entry for me is, you know, I keep talking about that and people telling me we can't do it, so there's the Simpson Desert, you know, we just got a little sniff of that at the end and, you know, for me, it's a pretty good sort of lead-in to go into a Simpson Desert track. Why not? Why not?